Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò della New York University. It's a great pleasure to have you all here tonight. Benvenuti a tutti, uh, especially to those of you who are here for the first time. And if it's your first time here, I invite you to um, visit our website, casaitalianaNYU.org, uh, to have a sense of uh, all the things that we do that include the screenings, theatrical performances, conferences, art exhibits, and much more. Uh, things that have to do with Italy, but in the most inclusive and ecumenical uh, sense possible. This evening's event is for us particularly important because on some level is a kept promise uh, by Elena Perazzini uh, that is behind the idea of this documentary. And a few years ago, I believe three years ago, Elena, we presented her book in which she um, sort of outlined the lives of several Italians who live in the US. And she mentioned, uh, in embryo, uh, the documentary that she would have liked to make uh, based on her book and more. And uh, tonight she has a chance to present it here. And um, also she was able to bring together a group of people that will be with us at the end of the screening. The screening lasts only one hour, so I invite you, all of you to stay for the uh, conversation that is going to, place, uh, to take place after that. And the conversation, of course, is going to feature Elena uh, Perazzini. It's going to be moderated by Paolo Pellecchia of CUNY, City University of New York. And it's going to see the participation of Gianluca Galletto, who is right there, uh, scientists Alessandra Lucchini and Roberta Marongiu, who are here, and uh, Roberta via Skype. And then artist Paolo Pelosini, that is right there. Thank you very much. Um, before we start with the screening, since all of you have an interest in uh, recent Italian immigration to the, uh, to the US, I would like to invite you also to participate in the panel discussion that we are hosting on Monday, November 12, in which we'll present two recent books uh, entitled, fittingly, New Italian Immigration to the US. The first one is about uh, politics and history, and the second one is about heart, art and culture. And these two books are a collection of essays uh, that uh, discuss uh, issues related to uh, recent immigration from Italy to the US starting from 1945 to today. Interestingly enough, that's the second wave of immigration after, of course, the first wave of immigration, 1880 to 1920, in which about five million people came to the US from Italy. This is a different kind of immigration uh, with different uh, hopes, different visions, uh, different praxis of immigration, also different locations in which they settle. Uh, but for us, it's very interesting always to provide an historical and political context to phenomena such as this one. And without further ado, I would like to sit down, for those of you who can, uh, relax and enjoy the screening, and invite you to stay for the discussion that will follow that promises to be at least as interesting as the documentary film that we're about to see. Enjoy. <laughs> Buonasera a tutti e gra grazie. <ride> Ciao e grazie veramente per essere qua. E siete tantissimi, non me l'aspettavo, sono molto molto felice e vorrà dire che faremo un altro screening probabilmente <ride> presto. Sì, decisamente. E Paolo è il nostro moderatore stasera, quindi ti lascio la parola. Thank you. English or Italian? English. I sorry, guess. yeah, I was supposed to speak in English. Right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <ride> It's all right, it's all right. See, I've been here for 20 years, but there is no way. It's hard to, to forget <laughs> being in, an Italian. Anyway, uh, I was thanking everybody. I didn't expect so many people. I'm very, very happy. And um, I leave Paolo um, the microphone, because we have some guests tonight, we're some of the protagonists of the documentary. And uh, I'd like to try, as soon as possible, to connect via Skype with Roberta Marongiu, the, um, the researcher uh, from Sardinia, because she's now in California, and she has about 40 minutes to stay with us so we can ask questions and uh, see what she's doing there because she's working on a new project. So uh, yes, I'm going to ask for some help for Skype. 
Uh, thank you, and, uh, and good evening. My name is Paolo Pilek. I'm mostly a friend of Elena, so regardless my uh, non-achievements. And um, so I'm going to moderate the Q&A session tonight. And uh, I first want to thank the Casa Italiana Zerelli Marmo for the beautiful venue, and uh, they allowed us to screen this compelling uh, documentary. And I want to also thank, of course, Elena for writing the, the book that inspired the documentary that Enrico Ventrici directed. And I thank also those, the protagonists of the, of the documentary, who opened up their lives and allowed uh, Elena and Enrico to, for their lives to be told, which is uh, significant in this context. Um, and uh, I also want to, last but not least, I want to thank you all of you because um, a documentary, uh, as beautiful as, uh, as it could be, if it's not uh, shared, if it's not viewed by an audience, is uh, almost unexisting. Um, then I, I, I would invite on the on the on the stage uh, here Paolo Perosini, who's uh, if you want to join us on the stage. And a round of applause, wherever you want. And um, Roberta Maronju, she's going to join us uh, via Skype. I would invite here uh, Gianluca Galletto. Uh, where, yeah, wherever you want. I'm going to stay as discreet as I can. Um, and then I see you already, and I would invite Alessandra. Directly from Virginia to New York. One of the... And my job here is pretty easy. Uh, I'm just going to introduce briefly um, the, 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 our guests and, uh, uh, and then ask some questions if, uh, if nobody of you has uh, any. Uh, so, um, Elena Perazzini is an Italian writer. Well, we can say it, I guess. Yes. <laughs> it's probably more comfortable. Uh, she's an Italian writer who lived here, and specifically in New York, for about 20 years. And Via Danoi is uh, one of her uh, four books. Third one. The fourth one is uh, in okay, progress. It's, okay, it's in progress. <laughs> All right, so um, did, I, did I spoil anything? No. No, 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 no. Okay. It's a completely different project, so there is nothing okay. to. Okay. So, and uh, but it's her first book that was translated into English, and it was adopted um, as a text for courses, university courses taught at uh, Buckner University and Dickinson College. Uh, Paolo Perosini, uh, he graduated from the Instituto d'Arte of Luca in 1964, and from the Academia d'Arte of Florence in 1969. He moved to the U.S. and enrolls uh, in the MFA program at the University of Minnesota. And in 1970, he switches from painting to conceptual art. Um, and we saw that in the, doc in the documentary. And he moves to New York in 1975. In 1982, he begins sculpting and cutting uh, found metal objects with an ax. Um, today, he still uses the, the same method and materials. And uh, in his studio in Spanish Harlem, which he doesn't like them much. <laughs> I live there too. I live there too. It is problematic, I agree. Uh, and in Massa Rosa. Uh, the list of his achievements and shows is long, uh, but one of the last ones has remarkably been shown at the Biennale in Venice, if I'm not mistaken, in 2011, correct? And Roberta Maronju, who's going to hopefully join us um, via Skype. Uh, she's in LA right now. She's an assistant professor in neuroscience and neurological surgery. She holds a secondary appointment at the Cornell Brain and Mind Institute. Her research focuses on the genetic causes of Parkinson's disease, uh, the Parkinson's disease and the development of the new adenosociated virus vector mediated brain gene therapies um, for Parkinson's disease as well. Robert, Roberta is also the co founder and president of STOPT a bicoastal nonprofit organization with a mission of giving people with Parkinson's disease the tools, the support, um, both physical and moral, as we saw, they need to achieve a higher quality of life. Then we have Professor Alessandra Lucchini, who's an associate uh, professor at George Ma Mason 
University. Uh, she focuses on development technologies to improve diagnostics and therapeutic a therape a therapeutics for devastating diseases, including cancer, inflammatory, and infectious diseases. Dr. Lucchini authored more than 50 peer-reviewed publications in chemistry, nanotechnology, um, and proteomics. <laughs> is it, is it proteomics, pro yeah. Proteomics, sorry. I'm a, I'm a humanist. <laughs> and, uh, and I know how hard it is to publish. Um, articles. She's co-founder um, and scientific advisor of the Ceres Nanosciences, Inc. Uh, last, no, not last, yeah, lastly, uh, Gianluca Galletto is the founder and president of DG Advisors, providing strategic advice to businesses, governments, and nonprofit organizations on global growth strategies. Always passionate about migrations in general, about Italian, uh, specifically, about Italian and the phenomenon of Italian talents escaping Italy, Gianluca has been invited all over Europe and the US to work on fostering innovation sectors, especially for countries and cities that have acute brain drain. Gianluca has been an advocate of immigrant entrepreneurs and has been active with FWD.US uh, or forward for the US uh, and launch the first citywide program to give access to foreign entrepreneurs <laughs> to H-1B visas without the cap uh, that is imposed in the United States, as we all know, uh, by the city of New York in partnership with seven CUNY colleges. Uh, now, so I would open uh, with questions from the audience, if there are any, which I hope, because uh, again, the, the documentary was extremely challenging for many of us, me uh, included, who are immigrants. So uh, please free, a microphone will go around. Uh, so uh, yes, um, just. I'd like to connect, if you don't mind, with Roberta, because she doesn't have a lot of time. Yeah. And we can start with questions to yeah. her. So yes, since she only has 40 minutes before catching a flight, if you can direct your questions, if you have questions that direct them to her, that'd be ideal. So let's go on because she didn't answer probably. No, she she's could, probably she under yeah. scrutiny. Okay. Yes. So um, I'm gonna give okay the microphone uh, the lady. Thank you. Very interesting film. I really enjoyed it. I was one. I was wondering how and why did you choose these particular people? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, first of all, I need to say that. The protagonist of the ah ah Roberta ciao hi how are you <laughs> good to see you I don't know if you can see us maybe we can uh, it's low si ti sentiamo ma è basso the volume is low okay adesso I think it's not amplified, I'm not sure. Ah, Pronto. okay, brava. Si, sí, yes. How are you, what are you doing in California? Tutto bene, sto per partire per l'aeroporto. But what are you working at? What are you, why are you there? Devo parlare italiano o in inglese? English. English? English? Yes. yes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, okay, okay, hi everybody. Hi. Hello. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just at a, a neuroscience conference, it's the international annual uh, neuroscience conference, so it's ending today. Okay, and did you... And I'm sorry, I couldn't... I'm, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, I, I was asked to present my research, and they really didn't give me any choice. It was either today or nothing. I so know. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there. 
I know. We are sorry to, but uh, I wanted to ask you if you, by any chance, had changed your mind because Roberta, uh, she went first to California for her work, and uh, years later she she came to New York. And as you could tell from her witness in the documentary, she is not very much in love with this city. She would love to go back to California, so I wasn't sure if maybe you have changed your mind and decided to stay. <laughs> I'll try, I wish. <laughs> No, I mean, I love, I love both East and West Coast. It's, it's a hard, it's, it's a tough feeling. I mean, when I'm in California, I miss New York. I miss having, you know, anything I want right there, uh, every time, all the time at the next corner. But then when I'm in New York, I miss California weather. And so it's a complicated relationship, I guess. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there any question for Roberta? Maybe you wanted to ask something. Any question for her? I know, yes, I will answer. Hi, Roberta. Uh, Hello, hi. Hi. So my name is Paolo. I'm the moderator here. Um, so I, I, I have a question um, about what you said in the, in the documentary. Um, uh, when you at some point you describe being uh, frustrated with your research, um, although you you gave a lot and pretty much everything, and you sacrificed a lot for your research, um, and at some point you say that getting involved with your patients allowed you to sort of gain gusto again for what you're doing for your research. Um, so I just I was just wondering why I was just wondering if you can expand on it um, because it's not to be taken for granted. Um, it's very hard to work in academia and it's very hard to gain gusto again. So I was wondering what allowed that in the specifics of your relationship with your patients. Does it make sense? Uh, I'm just gonna repeat the question because I'm not sure I understood everything. So you're saying that you're referring to the part where I say that working with the patients helped me love my research even more. Exactly. Right? The contact with the patient. But then I think I missed the end, the actual question. The question is, can you expand? Can you expand on it? Can you tell us a little bit more in details why the concrete relationship with your patients allowed you to to go back? I'm so sorry. Can you hear me here? Oh, see, sí. okay, okay, got it, got right. it. Um, Thank you. So, um, love for science, it's, uh, it goes up and down, I guess. Uh, you have, you know, good times and bad times. Uh, it's very tough, um, way better than what I could have done in Italy, but it's really tough to find f funding for your research and then compete with a million people that want to do the same thing that you're doing. So you go through, you know, high and low times, high when you're excited about what you're doing, but then you go through very low times, low, like, mood periods where you feel like nothing is working and probably not worth investing all your life, all your time, 24-7, into research. And so I was going through a very tough time back then. And then when my husband, we co-founded a nonprofit organization called Stop PD that helps people with Parkinson's disease. And so I decided like side by side to my bench research to also help the patients in their daily life. And I, I, I think I, I, I said in my interview that I fell back in love with science because I was having, I was probably falling out of love for quite a while and then the contact with the patients, getting inspiration, getting ideas from them because they give me great feedback. They tell me what they actually need, what type, what type of research they need. And that really helped me go back and fall in love with science again. And that's, so this double job that I have, it's been going on for the past four years. And since then, my life has changed. So that, that's what I meant. <laughs> 
Thank you. Oh, there's some more seats here if somebody wants to join us closer. Um, anybody else? Oh, the English, English. individuals that help teach her course to the else. <laughs> How is the research going there? I really want to know, because that actually I did find very interesting. My teacher's a trainer, and so I did want to understand a little bit more about how does that working for her. So the question, if I, yeah. So um, we have another question from the audience, and the question is, how's your research going? Uh, in the actual body of your work progressing? How my research is going? Is that a question? Yes. Yep. How is your research progressing? Is that how my research? How is it progressing? How is my research? Yeah. Oh, okay, it's going out. pretty well, I have to say. Um, as I said, by you know getting feedback from the patients, I actually uh, found that a lot of the research that we neuroscientists do, it's what we think it's what we need to do. But we don't think about what patients need. And so my research actually has shifted a little bit from trying to understand what tiny little molecules do, which was my interest, to a more translational type of research where I try to develop therapies for patients. So that's how it has evolved. And I think, I think the route that I took is way more interesting and I'm getting great feedback from the rest of the co neuroscience community. Um, I think it's going quite well. I think I made a, a good choice, made a, a good decision to you know, make this change. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sí. um, all right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberta, and uh, have a safe flight and come back thank you so soon. Much. All right. Thank you. Everybody. Bye bye. Sorry again. Bye bye. Um, Very good. So we had a question before, uh, prior to the Roberta. Thank you. The uh, question? Yeah, the question was how, yeah. how and why I chose these specific characters, people. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say that the stories that are in the book are not the same stories that are in the documentary, except for Alessandra. She's both in the book and in the film. Um, because at the beginning, the, I, the project was to, uh, of course, to, sh to document the stories of the people that were in the book, but for many reasons, they weren't available or they moved somewhere else. And so I had already submitted this idea to the um, Rai Cinema for a production, and uh, because uh, it took years, you know, it took maybe three years since I submitted the project to the time when they said yes. And so these people were no longer available and I said, you know, give me some time, I'm going to look for other people. And um, they were interested in having sort of a comparison between stories, two, between two stories. Uh, and so I needed to find two people that were working in the same field or they were living in the same place, or they came around the same time in the United States, something like that. And so I was really lucky because I met uh, Paolo and Alessandro first, who are also friends, live both in East Harlem, and are both artists, and they came in, in, to New York in completely different times. And I was very interested in portraying the nature of the Italian immigration in the last decade, because I think it changed a lot from decade to decade. And as uh, uh, Stefano said earlier, there are 
he, he talked about two waves of Italian immigrants, and, uh, but there are three waves uh, that are now reported, and you tell me if I'm right. So the first one is the, you know, 1880 until 1920, the second one is after Second World War, and the third one is considered to be at the beginning of the 21st century, and they, uh, they report it starts in 2007, the third big wave. Of course, it, the, the numbers are not, are not comparable to the previous two, but still, to me, it was interesting, and I wanted to explore the different characteristics of people who came in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. That's why I also picked some of these stories, because uh, Paolo came in 1969. Um, Ricardo came in the middle of the 80s. And then Jacopo came in 2002 or 2001. And then uh, I think Roberta 2005, five U2, and 2012 is Alessandro. Um, because I think people uh, were pushed by completely different reasons or uh, at least different expectations for sure. Um, also, uh, I was able to find some articles ab about what I was thinking and it confirmed what I was thinking so that, for example, people in the 80s and the 90s and even the 70s, they would come here mostly by themselves to sort of uh, have an experience and reach their resume and go back. So the idea was really to go back, not to move here. Uh, it was already a type of immigration with a high level of education, like now. Um, but people were coming with the idea of learning English or you know, doing internship and go back. Now in the new immigration we are talking about, 2007 until now, a lot of people, first of all, a lot of couples come together and they want to really start their family there, their li the, here, their life here, and they want to stay. And the expectations are very different because before there were, you know, the American dream was still very much alive. So I the idea to come here, it was because you wanted to achieve something huge, something really big. Now you talk to young people and they say they simply want to have a decent life, you know, to be able to start a family, to have kids, to have a nice house, a nice car and, uh, and something that they think they cannot achieve in our country, in Italy. So I, was tr I really wanted to explore these kind of differences. Thank you. There's a, another question there. I just wanted to know when the film was made. Has it come out recently? And has it come out in Italy? Uh, the film was made in the summer of 2017, and uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, it didn't come out in Italy yet. It's been produced by Rai Cinema, with, which is the Italian public TV, and it will come out on the Italian TV, not uh, in theaters. Not in theaters? No, just on the Italian TV. I don't know when yet. Anybody else? Oh, there's a there's a question over there. Keep on dropping this thing. Um, did the people you interviewed who came in this last wave tell you that they thought um, getting work visas or green cards was harder than they had expected? Yes, most of them, yes. And, uh, and the opposite was for the one who came, like me, 20 years ago. 30 years ago or 40 years ago, they all said it was easier. And uh, if you don't mind on this um, topic, I'd like to ask Gianluca, because I never understood well what is that you've been, no, I read on your resume a new thing. <laughs> no, no, first of all, no, I never did. I know you for 24 years, I never did, I swear. <laughs> because every three years he does something different, but anyway. Uh, I. <laughs> In New York, you have many different lives. Jacopo said it in the documentary, like cats, you know, nine. Here you can have even more. Yeah, Paolo probably can be a witness of that too, of many different lives. Um, maybe in New York, maybe. Um, or wives. <laughs> lives or wives? <laughs> 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 
a, a few of both. But, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, the wealth, the treasure of an old man, it's not money, it's not possessions, but it's the stories that you have to tell. And they have very, very good stories in New York, they have a very, very good collection. For, instance, for example, I saw the first blackout, the historical blackout. I saw both towers in the World Trade Center uh, fall down. I was there, I was in the disaster area. I was robbed at Gap Point. All my friends in Italy are jealous of that, you know. It's <laughs> like and uh, um, and and I'm, you know right now I think I'm doing my best work. You know I'm working day and night, and uh, so it's been a very rich, a very rich uh, story. Uh, New York is you know one of the most livable places in the world. It's no longer a good place for artists though, and uh, the reason is uh, it's very simple. You know when I came to New York in 1975. I rent a loft, a huge loft in Tribeca for $300 a month. <laughs> when I left out of 30 years, I was paying $900 a month. Now, not now, three years ago, somebody that lives next to, to the place, uh, I had to leave you know, after 30 years. He told me that the family that lives there pays $15,000 a month <laughs> for the same place. So the culture, culture, you know, the, uh, the you know, artists can no longer uh, live in New York, unless you, you know, there, there, there are some that work on their computer or their phone. They, they, but if you're a painter, if you're a dancer, if you're, a, there used to be so much culture, you know. That in, in Walker Street, when I moved there, there were two off Broadway theater. There was a burlesque. Uh, Place. There was a dance company, and artists live it. Everything is gone. Everything is disappeared, because so it's, it's still the place where you sell culture in New York, but, it's, but you know it's no longer it's no longer a place where you where you you know there are artists like anywhere anywhere else in the world, but it's not a place where people come to because the culture or to make art like it used to be. You had about thirty good thirty good years. You know the, the forties. Uh, not the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, uh, this city dominated the culture, the world culture. And now it's become global. Now they're everywhere. Artists are everywhere. There's no need to be here anymore. You, know. you can communicate with the people very easily. You can see in your computer, you can see a painting better than you see them in the museums. You know. So there is a, uh, it's not the feeling, you know, the place where you come because there is this this, uh, this cultural event, you know, going on. You come to the city because it's a very pleasant city, and and uh, if you have enough money, you can live very well here. But uh, I'm afraid that uh, most artists who live in this city, you know, most of my friends are gone, you know. And um, so that's uh, well. What else? Thank you. <laughs> no, I wanted to. Um um, about the, the the visa, yeah, the visa program that you are uh, advocating, and um, but I, uh, before that, I just want to say something about the appearance of Gianluca because, <laughs> no, just because he is not a boxer or a fighter who fights in bars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, he had an accident last night with the Vespa. As an Italian, you know, he was riding a Vespa, of course, with an open uh, helmet, right? <laughs> so that's why I just wanted to say, because he was extremely courageous and, and showed his great friendship coming tonight, because <laughs> he has painkillers and all that, really, really. Wow, this is, you, it, if I can't really smile, but you know, it's like you can see it. Sorriso Durbans, I feel like a, I came out of a movie of Eminem, you know, like one of those people that don't have teeth anymore. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting fixed. So, um, no, but I, just one thing also about Elena is I came here because I, I've known Elena f since 98, I think it was it's been probably my second or first second friend in New York. And we met actually, when I met you, I met Ippolito. So I met Elena in 1998. I just moved into an apartment in, uh, in Union Square, which was also much cheaper, uh, still at the time, but it just not, not like your time. 
Uh, and then we, I think through Romana Fabrizio, a journalist from Rice, who was doing some journalism, and said, come to me. And so we, you know, I get to introduce you to some friends. And then we went to see, there was a, a um, we went to uh, do some, we're doing some interviews in a place where they were, they were vampires, like me, uh, today. A and uh, do you remember that? It was in the meatpacking. The meatpacking is still at the time, it was very, very different in 98. And there was a weird bar where they was playing some gothic rock, and these guys were all like their teeth modified, and they were wearing lenses, and there was all this movement of vampires. And then we also remember some guy came out, so you're a vampire? No, I'm a wolf. <laughs> How many are you in the States? We're five. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was the best experience. That, that's uh, you know, one of the first experiences in New York. So, but, I mean, but just to say that Ellen and I have known her forever. Uh, and uh, I don't see her as much as I used to, but I think the friendship is the same, the affection is the same, and if Anna calls, I'd be there, and I think it's the same for if I do uh, for her. So I just want to, and, and this is a great, great uh, job that she did. I think really liked it. So on immigration, then I want to ask you a question uh, quickly. So on immigration, I you know I, I do this with like all over the, the world mostly with with people not just from where the town is, but something has changed very much in the last two years. Before, it didn't really. It's, it's really the Trump election that, that has a created a, 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 like a, a turning point. So in my case, what we did with the city of New York, that was like, uh, and then it's connected to uh, what Paolo was saying. So in order to attract and retain talent, which is really important for a city to live, and, and, and not, not just, we, we were looking more at the tech talent, uh, we will realize that this, the United States doesn't have an entrepreneurship or an entrepreneur visa, something that helps an entrepreneurs to get a visa without having a lot of money to put on their own because they're raising money. And a lot of them come sometimes out of university. So we did this program. We found a way to kind of sort of a loophole in the, in the law so that you can get an H-1B if you partner with colleges and with universities because universities don't have a cap. You can hire as many H-1Bs as you want, while normally there's only uh, 55,000 H-1Bs plus 20 for STEM, but the, the, the applications are usually more than, uh, than three times. So that's why they started the lottery. So we, the, the idea was that if you get a, um, first of all, you, you can get, you, you incorporate your company here. If you, you imagine you come out of the university, you're doing your coding or whatever, your algorithm. And then you partner with the university by which you provide some free services. In a sense, like uh, you participate in, um, in the curriculum or in, the, in teaching or hire uh, interns from the universities. Uh, and then you know, there's a bunch of other little things that you need to do uh, uh, legally. You can get an H-1B without going through the cap. So it was called the International Innovators Initiative, and it was the first in the United States that it was like we provided 80 seats, and, and, and we had seven colleges. And so that, though, we had 700 applications like, already in the first month. And once Trump was elected, I mean, not one, but like a few months later, once it was, you know, he started to, the, the law hasn't changed, but he started to tighten the screws uh, because the Homeland Security, it's a USCIS, which is the department that approves visas, is uh, takes way more time, rejects people on on ma on like small little things, and so it's become really difficult for anyone that comes from anywhere. I mean, not to mention, of course, if you come from Arabic countries. So yeah, that's that's changed. And but but I and I also but I also saw what you what you're seeing. People coming now with like their couples, because the situation in Italy also has changed. I think, and that's made a, a big difference. So I don't know if I answered the question or you, but uh, that, but I want to ask you something. Um, you so I I was impressed and uh, by the diversity. And I'm still impressed today, after 23 years I'm here, of the diversity of stories and, and experiences of Italians that come here. I, that's just a, the, the most diverse. I mean, even you try to, sh I think you try, I'm asking you if you try to show that in some ways, because it's not just researchers, but it's anyone, artists and people open restaurants. And, and, uh, and then so within that, what, what did you, um, what, I would like to know what, you, what your experience was as a as sort of a as an immigrant, uh, and then to Paolo, what is the difference aside from New York has changed definitely, but what was the difference 
from the Italy that you left at the time that you feel here that so the relationship between the two th the two places have changed so that was a little bit like my, my curiosity um, okay yes I <coughs> I definitely would have liked you know wanted to show the diversity of stories and in fact when I uh, when I'm asked to describe this work uh, it's not easy for me because I um, the easiest way to be understood is to say it's stories of Italian Im new Italian immigrants in the United States. And then when I say the word immigrant, it kind of doesn't sound right um, because uh, and I, it, it reminds me of a phone call that I received from Alessandro the night before we shot his interview. So I met Alessandro, I went to his studio, I saw his work, I really, really loved it, and we had a long conversation and we decided we were going to do the interview. And the night before he calls me, and he said, I don't know if you remember, and he said, Elena, I'm not sure I wanna do it. Uh, I don't really feel like, because I don't feel like a min an immigrant. I'm not really an immigrant, you know, I'm, you know, I'm here to work and to try to sell my work, but I'm not here to stay, you know, I might leave tomorrow to go back to Spain where I lived, or to go back to Italy, or to Asia, wherever. So, um, uh, and I said, don't worry, Alessandro, because I, I, you know, I use that word, because what else can I say, but I'm interested in telling stories, and I read just the other day the introduction, um, I'm stealing a quote now, uh, in the introduction of the book, of a book of a friend, where she, uh, she actually quotes uh, Italo Calvino, that says, sorry, because it's, it's interesting, it's really related to what you asked me. Um, no, no, it was. <laughs> uh, Ah, uh, yeah. No, he says. Um, so Calvino, uh, it, it's in a story with an ima in an imaginary world, in an imaginary point in the world with no names, nothing where different people arrives and the um, and the inhabitants became very worried because of the differences. So of course he's talking about immigrants, but he says, uh, but there were those who insisted that the concept immigrant could be in the abstract. It was a narrow-minded attitude that basically has remained with all of us. Mind you, it keeps cropping up uh, even today. So um, the concept of immigrant, and I totally agree, I mean, it's not in the abstract. It's person by person. Every person has its own, his own unique, special story. And that's what my work became, you know. I started by thinking I wanted to talk about the new wave of immigrants, the, the oldest one, but I ended up being very fascinated and intrigued by every single personal story of each of them. And I, you know, I would love to go on, <laughs> because as you said, it really shows the diversity of people who come, and at the beginning I wanted to, in fact, I wanted to uh, tell stories of Europeans in general, you know, but then the production was Italian, so I focused on Italians. Um, but I, I hope I was able to show part of that diversity. Please. You, uh, okay, okay. There was a question for you. There, there was a, a question, how different was Italy then? Uh, and in what? They, they both change uh, a great deal. Um, you know, I, I grew up. I grew up in a in a, in a f uh, on a farm uh, after Second World War, actually, and um, you know we didn't have any water. We didn't have any bathroom in the house until I was 14 years old. You know, forget about radio and television and all that. And uh, and then everything changed in a few years. In the '60s, boom came the refrigerator, came the water, came the TV, and uh, um, Italy changed enormously in a few years. And w when I came down here, I was 21 years old the first time, or 69, and um, was that know, something like that? And uh, uh, w when I came here. Uh, America was a completely different world. It was a wealthy 
uh, everybody, everybody had a job, everybody had a house, everybody had a, a car, like, you know, my, you know, people that I knew. Uh, it, it seems like there was one person working in the family and everybody did well, the children uh, went to college, so it's, it's changed enormously. There was this sense of wealth, you know. The, the, the biggest surprise when I got to Kennedy Airport that the cars were so big, I saw them on television, but I really realized that they were really uh, big uh, uh, as they were. And uh, uh, Italy at that time, you know, I, I come from a, from a beautiful place in Tuscany, you know, that's the Lago uh, Puc where Puccini wrote his opera. It's a small town, but it's the season, very beautiful. And uh, uh, so I came down here. Now, what, you know, the, the, the difference now is that you, you, you see that the middle class is much more impoverished. Not by, you know, everybody seems to be struggling except except the higher, you know, the people that are um, more privileged. And, uh, and, and Italy is uh, a change enormously too. It's like that lake is totally polluted. I spent my youth there and now you can even get close to it because the poison from architecture, from, uh, from, the, from the fields have kind of poisoned the whole lake. Torre de Lago Puccini, which was a beautiful, you know, uh, thing, and and here in New York, I, I I'm in Pleasant Avenue, and uh, it, it, next to my studio there is a garden where people used to cultivate. They still do. They, you know, they used to cultivate, and the garden is full of uh, of uh, animals, of, of birds, and uh, I've seen uh, there were crickets at night. Uh, there are. Uh, not in Massa Rosa. You don't hear the crickets anymore. The frogs are gone because the pollution. So it completely uh, a reverse of of the situation. And uh, you know, I'm both. Uh, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I would say that there is being a loss in both places. You know, that uh, America used to be a very, a very open, very. Uh, um, uh, you know, you, I, I came here. I went to the to the, the I went to Oberlin College for a semester. They pay they, they pay for me. I didn't pay for anything. I got a job doing uh, something, and uh, and then at the University of Minnesota, I didn't have to pay anything. It was very easy for me to get in there. They actually gave me a job to teach uh, drawing to students of architecture. There was that kind of. Uh, Openness and wealth that I don't think is here anymore. Now is much more close, much more difficult to to live in this country and to uh, the, the, than than you used to be. Uh, and uh, and Italy used to be much more serene and much more Massarosa, the place like a, a much more uh, interesting place. And I think now it's a it's, it's it's a depressed place. People are not happy. Everybody hates, you know, uh, they, they, they hate blacks and they hate uh, immigrants. You know, that's what you hear. You go to the bar and people used to talk about hunting, used to go there, talk about the lake, used to go uh, the good old times. Now they're talking about immigration. And uh, so, so there's a kind of darkness that has descent, in my opinion, in my experience, you know, in both, uh, in both places. Thank you. So, yeah, um, I have a question actually for everybody. And um, so, Alessandra, if you want, oh, there's a question from the audience. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. There's a question over there. I, I thought this was beautifully told, and I could relate to it in a lot of ways. Uh, what I think is very interesting is the number of you who have decided to stay, uh, or presumably, I know you talked about maybe going back. But several of you seem to have really made your life here, two decades, a decade and a half, many decades. I lived uh, for several years, four years in, in, in Latin America, in Chile and Argentina, but I always felt like an outsider. I never considered staying. And so I wonder what it's been like for you and whether it's changed over the years. Uh, what's made you stay? And, and do, you now, do you not at all feel like an outsider? I guess New York is a pretty inviting place. But what, what keeps you here? Uh, or do you consider that you may end up retiring or one day uh, returning uh, to live in Italy? Any of you, but, but may we I, heard from you. May so. I yeah, give it to Alessandra because she's the only one who doesn't live in New York. And I think, 
Um, and I think it's a totally different experience, you know, landing here and staying here and, and living in other places in the United States. Absolutely, and it's a great question because as an Italian, you go to Austria or to uh, Germany and you are an Italian. And you go to even, uh, you know, cousin Spain and you're an Italian, you come here and you're just a person with an accent that is very uh, glamorous and everybody says, oh my goodness, I love Italy. And they ask you about the spaghetti and Alfredo sauce that nobody knows in Italy. And, uh, <laughs> and and it's <laughs> and it's uh, it's this the spirit that I personally loved and uh, in my life I never dream of coming here or I had the idea somehow that speaking a language would be good for my brain well one more than my mother tongue and uh, uh, but where it be uh, I don't know Switzerland or uh, the UK I, I was. Uh, it was the same, but when I came here, I realized that it really doesn't matter. At least that's been uh, my uh, experience. And even in the suburbs of Virginia, where you would think, uh, I was asking, uh, met my husband is here, so what is that uh, flag with the, you know, the star? And he would say, oh, it's confident this flag, and he was telling me, but uh, it is uh, a persuasive sentiment that I feel of welcoming people. And, uh, and uh, I felt personally that everybody comes here has a space and uh, it's up to the person that comes to fill it. And with the space comes responsibility and comes the chance to succeed or to fail. And so this is something that um, I felt very strongly and I very much liked, uh, even in uh, a place that uh, on the surface might seem very uh, conservative or very eradicated in uh, uh, tradition like Virginia. Well, uh, then I put myself in this situation that I don't know if I would come back because I would need to uh, move an American husband to American children. And uh, I see for the very small excursion we go to, <laughs> uh, to do vacation and uh, it, it might be difficult. Nevertheless, you never know. And uh, what I can see is that they love visiting and they love the uh, culture there. It takes a moment to get used, you know, to the gelato and the pizza, that's right, and uh, um, you never know. But uh, certainly a welcoming situation here that I don't think uh, I would have found as an Italian in many other countries. Yeah. But if I'm not wrong, Alessandra, you came with a program, with an Italian program, mm -hmm. who uh, sends re uh, students, researchers to the, and it's called Bridges to Italy, right? Right. Bridges to Italy, so it's an Italian program who sends people uh, to study abroad and then they have to go back you know so kind of <laughs> you know <laughs> well to bring back basically you know the experience and so they finance this and but the idea is for them to go back and i remember when alessandra first told me her story uh, she ended up staying but uh, you haven't planned that you hadn't planned that right that's right you yeah it was it was first a matter of the uh, job and then a matter of uh, personal life so uh, it ended up being a, a, a story of uh, of staying but uh, to the truth of the out of the 50 people that were financed with by that project 48 went back to italy so i think that uh, it was overall a good uh, yes a good outcome <laughs> Achievement, uh, Alessandra, congratulations on your achievements, first of all. Thank you. Do you never have a sense of uh, sadness or regret that this achievement uh, couldn't happen in Italy? Or you are just focused on what is going to be the results? And these results, you see the results as uh, um, related to the United States, uh, or you see these results as uh, globally, with going globally? Absolutely. Thank you very much. And yes, that's another very good question. So when I was at the university, uh, there was this myth, you know, in the 80s or 90s of the United States, and you had this feeling of funding levels of 30%, 40%, or essentially everybody who wrote a piece something then got money and money was coming and the wealth. And then I came here and then the funding rate is 
10%, 5%, and uh, even uh, um, uh, my colleague was talking about. So yes, there is a sense of a regret because uh, a, um, it would be good to live uh, close to my family in a beautiful country like Italy and do research, which a lot of people do, and I'm in contact with wonderful scientists. And uh, I don't think, I don't feel like uh, uh, this separation. Maybe because now we live in a moment in which you don't need to be in a place to be connected to the place. Uh, but I certainly feel that is, uh, there is nothing uh, easy. Uh, I see a lot of colleagues left the States to go to the Middle Eastern countries or, I don't know, Singapore. So there is uh, this uh, very mobile and fluid movement of uh, um, at least people in, in science, but in business for that matter too. And um, I think is, uh, is a situation that is global at this point. And, and also the funding uh, goes into a uh, global project. And the topic uh, that uh, we mostly work on, I don't know, are infectious diseases that are mainly uh, relevant in, uh, I don't know, Africa or the Eastern Asia. So it is, uh, it is I think, a global endeavor. At some point, also the previous question is, I, I think when people stay, maybe your experience is a little bit different also because you're in Virginia, and uh, uh, I think the f people stay and getting m more integrated also because there are a lot of other Italians, I think. I think that that, that, is, uh, some, uh, that is an effect. The fact that New York has so many other Italians and makes you feel in some ways connected. And New York is very Italianized and became much more Italianized in the last 20 years. And Italianized means like you go and you can have, you don't miss, people will ask me like, oh, how do you eat there? You still, you know, until like 10 years ago, okay, I mean, I'm in New York, you can eat, you know, anything you want. But uh, and it's like, you know, like you eat, like give it bad, like you get a good cappuccino. Yes, I do. So, I mean, and so, you know, this was the que the word the questions. But I think that, I, first of all, I think that makes a difference. And I wonder if you maybe you confront with the others. And uh, the other fact was that everyone, I think it's when Ellen was saying it's a different experience. I also came with the idea of staying two years. I was I came with a Fulbright and I was I had the, the requirement of going back for two years. I met like after I changed my mind, I was supposed to work in Africa for the Com European Commission. So um, I, I had to s climb mountains to get that requirement reversed. It was a, it was a lot of serendipity and I, you know, I can go to the story, but not now. Um, and, uh, and there's something that struck me in, I don't know who said in the documentary, it's like, uh, when I'm in a place, I like to, to live it, to absorb it. I think somebody yeah, said that. Ricardo said that, yeah. yeah to Ricardo, absorb Ricardo, the culture. I really like what all Ricardo said. Um, yes, and that's something that in my case it was, for example, and I think everyone else probably in different ways, my case was also that I started to get really ingrained in New York in a way that uh, I wanted to absorb it, I wanted to live it and understand it. And I started to f also for, I met my ex-wife when I was at university here, and she was really, her family was really into politics. And uh, politics has al always been my passion since I was 15. So I got really involved with all the political world here in New York, in the States. And, and I, I could never dream and understand what, you know, what I could, the experience that I made, if I go back 20 years ago, my dream was to go back to Italy um, and, and do, you know, politics. Yeah, I've, I've tried to do both, but it didn't work. And, and yeah, no, no, but, and, uh, but I think that was something that I, I'm just talking, I want to talk about the serendipity of, of what you do. And New York has an enormous amount of that. And it's based on the fact that you have diversity. It's based on the fact that you have so many immigrants coming here. And it's based on the fact that immigration is such, an, such a great, beautiful thing that enriches a place. And that's why New York has been so great. And when you were talking about, sorry if I go to this, it's, I'm really passionate about this. When you talked about the Italians, they're now, are, fuck, Sorry, I wasn't having a fast word, but in, like in, in the all like uh, in Virupati in, in this, I can't translate it, in this narrative, narration that immigration is the biggest of their problems. It's just like crazy. And the, 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 the blood of a city is the, f is the creative people that come here. And in San New York is risking to lose that too because it's too expensive. So I think we need to, I liked what you're doing because you, 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 we need to cherish what we have and what we've, this is what makes a place great, and this is what has made this place great, what you felt. And now, I don't know if it's going to be like that for a long time, but we'll see. We got a blue wave last night.
Thank you. Um, are there any, any other questions? Oh, here. Um, hi. Uh, this is a question for Alessandra because I was, um, when you were talking about your kids saying that they're very American, especially the com uh, com competition and all that, uh, I was wondering if there is something about your upbringing that you would like to, to give to your kids but because you're in America, it's very hard. And, yeah. Absolutely, that's very, uh, very true. I would love to uh, give a sense uh, of the family and a sense uh, of a community. And um, uh, I think that uh, in the suburbs, at least where we live, that's happening um, because the community somehow is uh, stable and uh, the family has some roots, and we have a, um, well, my husband's side of the family is there with a the number of, ki of uh, cousins. So somehow, uh, they, it, the life I lived uh, with my number of cousins, you know, running around uh, in the big family reunions and knowing pretty much everybody in the neighborhood is somehow um, uh, recreated here. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's very important uh, to me. Another thing that I would like to pass to them is, uh, and I don't know how can I do that, but I, is without you know, hurting the relationship, it would be a way to get closer to people in a way that uh, somebody was saying uh, in the documentary, the Italians do. And uh, it's not only the personal space when we talk that sometimes people jumps back because I, without thinking, go close to people without meaning nothing. But it's also, uh, you know, a feeling of caring and uh, without being intrusive in the other people' uh, um, privacy or sphere, personal sphere. So uh, some, somehow I would uh, hope and love my children to become like that, uh, but uh, somehow they will have to have uh, probably a selection on who to go closer to. <laughs> right, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank our guest. <laughs> and Elena. Yes, no, I wanted to, of course, to thank everybody, as the participant in the documentary because of what Paolo said earlier, I mean, because they really gave so much of themselves, of their story to us. And I would like them to come up to, on the stage, please. Jacopo, Riccardo, Alessandro is gone somewhere. I would like to thank, I really would like to thank very, very much, of course, <laughs> La Casa Italiana, Stefano Albertini for the hospitality. And I need to thank my amazing translator. I would like her to come please on stage because she, because I, no, translator, we are talking about assimilating to a new culture. So translation is a really, really difficult thing. And I worked with three translators until I found the best one in the world. <laughs> and she translated my book. Uh, the book is upstairs in Italian and in English, and she did the subtitles of the film. Valentina Bianco, thank you very much. Please. No. I just wanted to say something. And then we go and our friends prepare the reception upstairs. So there is also Italian style, you know, we close things with a drink and something to eat. <coughs> but I was rereading the data of uh, ISTAT and all the statistics um, institutions that document the numbers and they're very impressive. They're reaching the numbers of the after war. And Italy is the eighth country in the world that, uh, from which people immigrate. So it's immediately after Mexico and just before Vietnam, just to give a sense of where we stand. So when the phobia for immigrants that we witness in Italy reaches the levels of paranoia that is reaching in this country now, it gives us much to think. And that's why I believe that the documentary by Elena is gonna have a great impact when it's finally aired by Italian television. And also the documentary is important because these are numbers. Uh, 110,000 people and 42% and 31%. She unveiled 
the individual stories behind each of these people. And that is actually, I think, when we have a reaction. When behind the numbers, we see the stories, we see the real lives of people that have changed and been transformed by this experience. And I would say, looking at all of you for the better. Thank you very much. Thank you.